Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 14, 2024, are from Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 15. Our alternate first reading is 2 Samuel 6, 1 through 5, and then 12b through 19. Psalm 85, 8 through 13, and we begin a seven-week run through Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, and then a very disturbing, challenging text from Mark, the beheading of John the Baptist, Mark 6, 14 through 29, and we are grateful that one of our own podcasters, that would be Matt Skinner, wrote a very helpful commentary on a very difficult text. So listeners out there, go and and read that commentary by Matt on this challenging passage. And so it, 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 yeah, it's, it's challenging. And I think one thing that I wanted to say on the front end is uh, it's even it's made even more challenging or more poignant or one of those things in that what surrounds this passage is the sending out of the disciples and their return. Mm-hmm. And so this uh, this passage then is in between, you know, that mission of the 12 and then their return back in verse 30. Uh, the apostles return back to uh, Jesus. And so it that's, you know, that's that reality of of what it means to be a a forerunner of Jesus or a follower of Jesus going back to Mark one. Uh, and that this ends up being John's fate. Uh, also then has you go back and reinterpreting our passage from last week in the sending of the disciples and, uh, and, and, and what they, what they face and what the realities are when you announce that the kingdom of God has come near and when you are called to prepare the way. So that's a first narrative literary context that I wanted to remind our listeners of. Yeah, it's, you know, and and there's going to be next week, the passage will begin with Jesus wanting to go away for a little while. And mm-hmm. so this is part of the reason it's not that he's necessarily an introvert or, you know, needs rest, worried, worried that the disciples are overworked. It's that the landscape is quite dangerous in mm-hmm. chapter six. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think what's interesting, too, about this passage is that it uh, follows, I mean, it falls roughly in the middle of Jesus' public ministry, you know, before his entry into Jerusalem. And and we've talked about how in Mark the, you know, the 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 resistance or the controversy is is Im- almost immediate uh with uh with with Mark's Jesus and particularly um Jesus' authority. And so it and but yet at the same time what's so um what what's so striking and hard about this is you know the last time we heard about John the Baptist of course was in was his arrest mm-hmm. back in chapter 1 and we haven't mm-hmm. heard a thing mm-hmm. and yet he has such a he has such a prominent role in the first chap and you know the first verses of Mark and then also you know the connection to uh, a connection to the pro- the prophet Elijah, so it sort of sets up this. It sets up this also background of of the reality of of prophetic the prophetic beings uh, and the ways in which um, the ways in which uh, prophecy is met with or those prophetic words are met with um, such extraordinary uh, resistance, but here violence um, and. And literally getting rid of the voice, right? Silencing the voice, um, which for me raises quite a number of questions with regard to uh, the way in which, um, as you talked about in your commentary, Matt, the way in which just this kind of um, un, uh, unchecked power or what power mm-hmm. does, mm-hmm. Uh, even when there might have been some sympathies on the part of 
you know, on the part of Herod toward John, um, other powers come into play who want to keep their power. And, and so it's not just one person in power, but the multiplicity of the powers at work that, that seek to, uh, seek to silence truth or seek to silence words that, that don't want to be heard. Uh, agreeing with everything that you just said. And also the sympathy that we get here, even though it's around his desire for power uh, that Herod displays is compromised um, because he he's afraid of losing, like, like you're saying, that power. And I, I just... I just wonder how many times is that true for us, is that in our heart of hearts, uh, in our depth of reason, we recognize a truth, but the circle in which we believe we want to be affirmed or we want to hold statue in um, doesn't share uh, that perspective, doesn't, um, doesn't, uh, isn't, isn't, Captivated, if I could use that word, there was a, a level of captivation that 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 uh, Herod had for John, and he ignored his own uh, hesitancy because it was more important for him to be um, uh, recognized uh, among the people, and particularly uh, uh, among his wife. I just wonder where that where that is played out in our own lives, or if we're able to be sympathetic uh, as we read this story, can we step out of the headlines that we read in our news today, in, in what's happening in our reality today, if we can step away from that headline to be equally sympathetic and then to say, am I holding on to truth or am I just holding on to the power I think I might have if I remain silent. I would hope we all we see ourselves less as as Herod and Herodias in this story, and not forget about John's disciples um, mm-hmm. in terms of a kind of where do people of faith fit into this? There's a way in which Herod and Herodias and Salome are almost just utter caricatures. You know, I mean, they fit the type of you know, look at other other biblical accounts of of courtroom scenes there's something really courageous about what these disciples do at the end of the story, um, yeah. refusing to be intimidated. So I, yeah, I won't say more. I talk about that in the commentary, but if there's a message for like people of faith in here, there is a sense of a warning, but it's also a, what are you going to do about it? Kind of a, kind of a message for me. Well, and I think too, when you go back and, uh, the comments that I made earlier about the narrative context with regard to uh, the disciples' mission um, Mm -hmm. of going out and coming back, it ends up being uh, then perceived, I think, as an act of discipleship. What is, what is, what is the, what is the mission of a disciple look like? um, Mm -hmm. And how does it get, how does it get embodied? And so it's hard not to see then their, their response to this, uh, not through, uh, through, not not to see it through that light of <laughs> that this is one way that they act out they act out what it what it means to be a disciple and it ends up being of course ironically here and not later in the story uh, um, with Jesus but it yes. does point to a uh, point to a way in which they are they're uh, being they're being faithful disciples uh, and um, and that's and that's one way to perceive it I think too. If I can use a movie imagery with that, um, and it's an old movie now, which is I find hard saying that, um, but the scene in uh, The Hunger Games where um, uh, Katniss responds to the death of Rue, who is supposed to be her enemy, um, becomes a, 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 an act of defiance uh, against what the capital is asking. But it also becomes a moment that empowers uh, the people to realize that they can treat um, the other as neighbor, uh, as friend. Um, And 
uh, it's 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 a um, mediated parallel that came to mind um, as I as I was thinking about the the ending here. Should we go to Amos? Yeah, let's do it. All right. <laughs> well, I think this passage shows up in um, in Year C when in the semi continuous reading. So if you're if you're worried about plucking this out of context, you'll have a chance to kind of go back to Amos, you know, next year. But anyway, it's just a great uh, it's a great reminder of of prophets' propensities to uh, to annoy the people who have power. Uh, and who are are in power? I, I love the, um, the the comment that Amaziah makes about the land is not able to bear all his words. In mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. you know, Amaziah purports to be acting on behalf of the larger nation. Right? This is just going to be bad for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that gets parsed out politically, right? Um, you know, sorry, John, this isn't good for you. I mean, something similar happens, I think, with Jesus in, in John's gospel is a chapter 12, where the leader, the temple leadership gets together and they're like, this is just going to be bad for Jerusalem if we let this guy keep talking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So 12 or 13, um, 12. And, you know, this, it's the burden of leadership, right? The leadership doesn't like to hear prophetic pronouncements. <laughs> Because leadership has something to protect, and it's not always mm-hmm. necessarily self-interest. So that line between self-interest and the common good is easily uh, blurred or moved around. Um, but just a kind of a helpful way of showing that John's identity as a prophet is throughout, right? From his mm-hmm. ministry to his dress mm-hmm. at the very beginning, uh, and then all the way until um, the, the way he dies. And then, of course, the way Jesus will die has a rejected <laughs> prophet. What I was thinking about uh, was just what it means to uh, set a line uh, that is countercultural uh, and being able to um, recognize that if you hold to that line, it will be uh, difficult. It will be difficult for you. It will be difficult for others. And that's the prophetic voice. That's the truth telling um, that um, it is a counter narrative to uh, what the culture would like to make comfortable, um, what the culture is willing to bear, that in actuality becomes worse by ignoring what is God's truth. I really appreciated that unpacking a little bit more of that image in the commentary of a plumb line. Um, yes. And, and the way in which, you know, it, it uh, it's, yeah, I mean, I don't do much building. Um, I don't do much uh, construction work, but uh, but if a, you know if a wall stands true, and then you ha- then he talks about how that that Israel is not plumb; it is crooked, unjust, unrighteous, and uh, and corrupt. And for me, that that sparks some homiletical uh, curiosity around. Uh, where and where and how do we see those plumb lines, um, and are those plumb lines, as the commentary talks about, uh, are they in line with God's justice and mercy, protection of the poor and the vulnerable, or not? And so, I think it could be a really interesting and maybe an important image to um, to build in a sermon of what of of where do we see. Uh, where do, where is that plumb line? How do we know that it's, <laughs> when do we know that it's not straight? When do we know that it's, when do we see that it's crooked? Uh, and, and where do we, where do we adjudicate that and how do we adjudicate that? And so that's something that were I to, were I to preach on, on this passage, I would, I would go in that direction. I think, again, noting my uh, <clears throat> lack of construct construction skills. How about metallurgy? I would spend a lot of time talking about tin and how yes. it's probably not a plumb, <laughs> tin probably not even a plumb line anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what is that line that, what is that, what is that thing called where you like make a line to make a, a straight line in painting? Is that, what is that thing called? You ever done that before where you like, when I paint, go that's and then a it, mistake and I needed like a racer for line? it. Chalk line. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. So it's a line and, you know, it's like, so, which I've used before. 
And most chalk lines have a plumb bob on the end of them in terms of where the spool is. There you go. See? Yeah. A little bit. Who needs to be a builder? We just need to be artistic. (laughs) (laughs) Should we talk about the psalm then? Since that's kind of, uh, I think, I think Amos inspired. I mean, we don't get Amos's positive message. We get Amos's negative judgment. But here you've actually got this line about love and faithfulness, righteousness and peace. I mean, what is, what's the image, what's the positive side of Amos's vision? And that fits with what you were saying, Caroline, in terms of uh, how do we know when, when it's plumb and the concern is for how are the least of these uh, being cared for? Um, and that, that, that this Psalm actually, as you're pointing out, pulls that out from the portion of Amos we're not reading here. No, and I think it becomes another way to articulate or give language to what what is uh, what does God's justice look like um, with mm-hmm. really with really appealing images in terms of righteousness and peace will kiss each other, uh, mm-hmm. and so we get these we get these really rich images of what what does God's uh, how do we determine what God's justice looks like uh, and when do we know when we've um, crossed the line and or the, you know, the wall is um, crooked. (laughs) So yeah, I, I, that's how I would use the Psalm for sure. Yeah. The poetry is so beautiful in this, in these Mm -hmm. verses from the Psalm uh, and Clint McCann's commentaries are always so good. Yeah. Uh, And it helped me see ways in which the poetry here is talking about the ways of God that are embedded in human relationship, mm-hmm. right? In terms of people meeting or, or kissing, as well as the things that grow from the ground or the things that fall from the sky. In other words, God's ways are embedded in human relationship. Mm-hmm. God's ways are embedded in creation and what we call the natural world and just this kind of kind of harmonious sense of how human relationship and the, the the context, right? The world in which we live have ways of, you know, expressing um, the love of God. Right. And so to go back to something like Amos, then it's Amos's message is not just about a a kind of perfect legal system, right? It's a way of creating a community Uh, and similar to John, right? If anybody's going to go into Mark six and dig into John's criticism of Herod, it looks a little bizarre. It's probably this obscure Leviticus text about about intermarriage, um, or actually more about like not widening the marriage when a when a when a sibling's spouse when a siblings die, like what happens to their spouse. You know, I mean, it's hard to see like why that's such a big deal to John or why that's such a big deal to Herodias. But to talk about kind of the ways in which the the, the, the law itself has this sense of righteousness, peace, yeah. justice woven into it. Um, it's a lot of work for one sermon to bear. But if you have a congregation that's already talked a bit about, about law and about choosing the things that make for life, there's actually some some nice coherence among these three texts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it puts it, it puts the the preacher in a place to talk about the, um, the benefits of the law and why the law and, uh, and, and that the law of God is good and, um, is for the sake of, um, for the sake of God's own, own righteousness and for the sake of, uh, of that righteousness to be manifest in, in all places and particularly between God and God's people. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's always, a <laughs> that's, that, that's, Frequently, I should say, a, a, an important direction a preacher can take when so much uh, negativity typically happens uh, around preaching about law. Yeah, God's in particular. So, Second uh, Samuel. Oh boy! Oh boy! The Ark. Are we going to add verses? Uh, would you like to add verses? Not if I'm preaching. <laughs> It's just convenient how verses 6 through 12a have been left out here. but uh, I know. So, you know, uh, Klaus Peter Adams' uh, commentary is really good and worth sitting with yeah. to think about oh. some of the power dynamics that are going on in this part of, of David's story. And and just to talk about the, you know, the need to lift some of these up uh, and to talk about 
uh, these aspects of, of, of tokens, <laughs> these mm-hmm. aspects of power, and how what David's doing here is a very shrewd move of uniting political and religious power, right, or kingly and priestly power. And, you know, there's something that might be perfectly fine about that in some ancient settings, of course, but it's also, um, it's just worth talking about. <laughs> Uh, and by power, I don't mean like just a symbol of authority. This arc has got quite a bit of power, as you learn in verses 6 through 12a, Mm -hmm. uh, when Uzzah tries to steady it because the ox slips and is is struck dead. Um, So, and then David's like, David's (laughs) like, I got an idea. Let's let this guy Obed-Edom keep the ark for a while, and he can have it in his living room, and he can be afraid of it. And mm-hmm. then Obed Edom takes it into his house, and Obed Edom just starts thriving. Like everything he does is like he's got this Midas touch. And then they tell David, like, "Hey, have you heard Obed Edom's doing great? Everything's going really well for him." And then David's like, "Let's bring it to Jerusalem again. <laughs> like, we need this. We need this." Yeah. So it's it, it's this interesting like it's it is a, it's both a token and it's also not at the same yeah, time. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. it's almost as if David realizes it's too dangerous to not have it in his. I don't want to say control, but under his aegis, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it, it it also points to our perspective of things. You know, the thing itself doesn't change. The perspective does, and therefore the reality is different. So, you know, when you're thinking about it, again, these are the verses that aren't there, but when you're thinking about it in terms of, oh my goodness, um, this, this, this could kill you. Uh, maybe I don't want to be up too close on it. And then the other is, is that, oh, it can bring me um, um, a fortune. I I, I got to bring it back. And um, it's th- nothing's changed with the art. Nothing's changed with the power of God it represents. But something definitely has changed in the imagination of David. And I think, I think too, there's like, well, I can't read this whole thing and not think about, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Indiana knew how powerful the Ark was. So there, uh, <laughs> but he knew the power of the Ark, but there is kind of irony, isn't there in that, in that what the Ark can do. And yet, and yet, yeah, to what extent David does then doesn't want to let it go, but there's something, uh, there's something really ironic in the fact that, um, there's this, there's a, an attempt to control it, which at the end of the day is to control God's presence God, right. and, uh, you know, to have that, to, to be able to maneuver <laughs> or negotiate where God's going to be. And mm-hmm. so I think that those are some wider, uh, homiletical or theological directions a sermon could take, uh, that what are, what are our, uh, symbolic arcs now, uh, mm-hmm. that, that represent, you know, represent the presence of God, uh, and yet, uh, which we want dearly, <laughs> which we want, um, we want that presence of God, and we want the assurance of the presence of God, and yet at the same time, where and how are are we exerting a kind of, um, or we think we are exerting a kind of control that we really do not have, um, mm-hmm. and so there's a kind of uh, check on our, I think, hubris there. <laughs> if you will. I, I really appreciate that, uh, that again, uh, Klaus, uh, Peter Adams got the, um, the commentary about Michael as well in this, yes. mm-hmm. not just because he refers to Kennergy and Barbie land, but, um, I love that. Like that's just also a really important thing to, I'm good enough. to note. <laughs> Uh, it's just important. If you're going to preach on this text, I think you have to talk a bit about Michael and, and remind people who Michael is. You know, this yes. is this is Saul's daughter, and mm-hmm. by marrying her, David is preventing Saul's lineage from growing mm-hmm. uh, as well. So, I mean, this is this is also a very politically savvy and convenient marriage for David exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, mm-hmm. in terms of protecting his power. And so, yeah. So don't don't treat her as like a joyless scold or something like that. There's mm-hmm. there's more going on as we'll learn in a couple of weeks. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Ephesians. We have seven weeks, seven through, weeks. The, through the letter of Ephesians. And I am going to put out a pretty radical suggestion. Uh-oh. You Uh-oh. Ready? Uh-oh. 
And that is, uh, of course, verses three through 14 are all one sentence. Uh, and, and, but it's one big, long beatitude, right? Blessed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's this big, long nine verse, no, 11 verse, 11 11 verse, one verse, 11 verses beatitude. And I am going to, and, and as you, as I did some reading on this, uh, on, you know, going back to some of the things about Ephesians, uh, you realize too, that this letter is deeply doxological, liturgical, prayerful. It has that style to it, which in part, I think matches what it's saying about Jesus, uh, and and the claims it's making about Jesus. So I'm going to put out there for the creative types uh, who want a summer challenge. Uh, I just, I, you know, in, in looking ahead with Ephesians and, and experiencing this language again, uh, I would use Ephesians for the whole time unless you want to do a sermon series on it. If you want to do that, maybe there's some of you who are doing a sermon series on it because you, then you can skip the bread of life. I know that there are some of their, those out there who are wanting that they're so don't want to do the bread of life that they do Ephesians. Uh, but I would use this liturgically throughout the entire time to take the wording that you have in this letter and uh, because it can be it can be um, doxology it can be prayer it can be dismissal it could be benediction uh, so what would it like to uh, to embed this letter in the worship experience of the congregation and say this is what we're doing um, or you could do that and then have some, you know, some commentary or like a homily on Ephesians. But that's my suggestion. So you are go. you saying are you saying that for each of the selected readings per week? Or uh-huh. are you saying okay, all right. Every week. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's what I would do. But I, I like have other that. things to say about Ephesians. Mm-hmm. In the next three weeks, if you're not doing that, but that I'm putting that out there as my as my suggestion. I like that idea for getting the the uh, docs, the doctrinal words before the congregation week after week. Yeah, it's just it's there's some beautiful like liturgical doxological claim here claims mm-hmm. here. So anyway, that's what I've got. I will, like I said, have more to say in the coming weeks about specific aspects of Ephesians if you go that direction. But that's my. That's my worship, liturgical, homiletical thought. It's excellent. What if you're preaching on Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, however, and you're thinking, How this, <laughs> how's this podcast going to help me? There's so much here, right? It's so hard. You're not going to preach this whole passage because yeah, there's right. so many right. individual images, claims, assertions that deserve some explication. I deserve some 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 lingering over. And that's and that, worth when, pointing out too, that there's so much in here. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's in part where it's difficult is that it, it doesn't lend itself to it's hard. It, it's harder to preach because it is so liturgical and doxological. So if mm-hmm. I only, mm-hmm. if I were going to preach it, however, I think I would focus on uh, the beatitude and the mm-hmm. way in which you have in that those first verses of the of this pericop- of the pericope, blessed who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Uh, and so what? And uh, are there a couple of things? Um, from the particular passage that you could lift up as uh, as words that your congregation need to hear about what it means to be blessed, uh, mm-hmm. and and um, and and what does it what does it mean to be blessed by God the Father and Christ and uh, and are there like two or three of this long, <laughs> very deep uh, deep ideas that would resonate with people. So that's what I would do if I were just preaching on it. I would also talk a bit about um, preaching. I would preach on preaching. I mean, I would talk about the ways in which I would fess up to people that, yes, it's hard to preach on a passage like this for reasons that you said. But I would also say there's a way in which 
this letter as a whole, particularly this part, particularly the end of chapter three, reminds us that one of the functions of theology is doxology. One of the functions of theology is praise. Good theology should lead you to praise mm -hmm. as opposed to understanding or other things. And just to talk about how often with sermons, we expect a sermon to lead us into a sacrament, for example, right? The sermon mm -hmm. paves the way for a sacrament or the sermon sets you up for a response. How will you respond to God's word? We'll take the offering now right? Or we will uh, have an altar call in some traditions, or there'll be some kind of a charge, you know, to go out. But what if the response to the sermon is praise? Mm -hmm. I know there's more theologically going on in the service than the sermon, but just to kind of talk about what would it mean to hear a sermon and be led to praise? And some traditions do that a lot better than others, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, there's often a time of silence after sermons in some traditions. What if the response to a sermon was just a kind of full-throated praise. And just to kind of imagine why don't we do that or why do we do that? Mm -hmm. What would that look like? Mm -hmm. What are we expecting like from the proclamation of God's word? I mean, I, I could see an interesting sermon where you kind of pull apart the the logic, the theologic of a worship service, but also the purposes of, of a given sermon. Mm -hmm. What I a better like place that. to start than Ephesians 1. I like that. The, the word that stuck out for me was inheritance. And uh, I was thinking, as you were saying, uh, Caroline, um, I really was taking that um, less in, in terms of the spiritual inheritance, but uh, what does it mean to be a part of a community that has experienced these blessings from God and been uh, adopted into uh, the family of God to... Uh, return to one another what ha we have received. So um, in all of the things that Christ has done for us, forgiveness, uh, grace, uh, redemption, um, uh, that, that we are now a part of a community where we do that with one another. And so the inheritance becomes not what I individually have received, but because I have received it, I offer this to others. I don't know if um, that idea followed with the story of example might result in what you are describing, Matt, where folks would just have to shout, wow, or thanks be to God, or as you said it, praise. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave, and be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.